<laughs> you see this little icon here? No. This is eating up the data of my... What? What is that? It's called Remote Buddy. Oh, yeah. I did my slideshow with this thing. Oh, oh okay. Found, I found it. Go away. That helps. It now I get my head. Okay. Um, so, just to show that the interesting thing, what I personally find very interesting about this, this controller is that the way that you play is completely different from anything. And it's very intuitive. The synthesizer that I'm using is, uh, will be driven by junction. There are two sequences which are running. And the only thing that I'm changing in the sequence, in the, in the, uh, the, the sound itself, is filter frequency and volume. <coughs> Three-dimensional mm -hmm. accelerometer, yeah. and of course, what you can also do is, uh, and what we have done uh, quite a lot with other stuff at Stein, is um, pull out the electronics of this. Yeah. But the problem is, what you end up then with is a sort of a, a chewing gum stick, uh -huh. a print, and there's no way you can make that smaller. It's, uh, the only thing is, you can make it thinner because. The biggest part of this is batteries. And of course, you can put another kind of battery in it. Mm -hmm. But you can, you could easily uh, put it into some kind of clothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we did a, a we uh, that was also I think it's completely forgotten to mention. We did a nice we symposium kind of thingy here uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, people showed their different usages of <coughs> Wii remote. And uh, this has become uh, quite a big hype in this whole community. Uh, that's what's actually a guy who did an internship at Stein, who uh, is a DJ, and he calls himself now a WeJ. And actually, the beginning of next year, there's, uh, he is on television um, at the VPRO, and they're showing an, uh, an item about him using the Wii remotes, because what he showed very well is that as a DJ now, and he was more a traditional kind of DJ, you know. but now he doesn't have to stand behind his table anymore. Now he can just walk into the audience, play and dance with the people while making all these gestures. And, and so, 
if you want to know more about the developments. Taku was asking me about some of my education and where I studied, and I know I'm dating myself, but I probably have some good company here. Um, <laughs> when I was in uh, college, I went to the School of Engineering at University of Michigan before there were such things as personal computers, and uh, I had a rude awakening when I went down to the to where they stored all the computers and they had these giant mainframes and to learn computer programming we had these key punch cards and I had to learn Fortran and Watt 4 and Watt 5 and I decided I did not want to be a programmer, I did not want to be an engineer, I was a total nerd, I had my little Texas Instruments calculator, I was one of the only women in the school and uh, you know, had my little slide rule and Get me out of here, not what I want to do with my life. So, forward paddle a bit. I put this in just uh, when I did finally graduate from college. Um, I became a river guide for a little while in California. And <laughs> I included it sort of because it's been a metaphor, I think, for how my life has gone ever since. And I'm just kind of on this wild ride, and I never know what's going to be around the next rapid when I get there, until I get there, and there's usually a few rocks and a lot of water along the way, and I am somewhat of a fish. I love to swim and be in water, so um, it takes me crazy places. So the next thing I did was I spent two years traveling around the world, and I went to Africa and Asia, and I studied music and dance. I thought I was going to be gone for six months, and I was gone for two years. I bought a one-way ticket from... San Francisco to Bangkok with no idea really where I was going to end up. <laughs> um, just had the most amazing experiences and after that trip tried to spend at least a month out of every year going to another part of the world making music and at the time dance be a focus of the work that I was doing. Um, and just to really immerse myself in culture as much as I could and learn, take away whatever I could in terms of inspiration to bring that back to whatever was happening in my life. Down in the right corner down there was um, about five years ago, I uh, was invited to go and study in Japan with an offshoot of Kodo on a small island called Sato Island where they still practice a lot of traditional arts and. So we actually got to play on Koto's gigantic type of drums and I studied with them. And, um, and in Cuba and a number of other places where music is just so much a part of everyday life that it's been a real inspiration for me and I try to bring that to other things that I do. Whoops. Um, so when I came back from all those travels, I saw some people playing in a marimba band in San Francisco. Uh, out in front of the Moscone Center, and they were playing these giant Shona marimbas from Zimbabwe. And I had been studying drumming while I was in Africa, and I was also classically trained on piano, and I felt marimbas are just the perfect way to combine melody and percussion together, and these instruments are part of an ensemble of seven instruments. So there's a bass, a baritone, tenor, uh, two tenors, and three sopranos. And uh, it was a style of marimba that was brought to the United States by uh, Dumi Mara Ire, who was from Harare in Zimbabwe, and he was teaching up in Seattle. And there was this whole subculture that was growing up around the people that he was teaching to play and to build these instruments. And one day when this bass marimba was too big to lug around, we brought a DX7 synthesizer instead. So this was like 1985. And, uh, and used it as the bass instead, rather than renting a truck to haul that around. 
And that's where the first seeds germinated for building an electronic marimba. And so we talked to a number of different people about taking apart the brains of keyboards and could we use this and went to a few NAM shows, National Association of Music Merchants. And at that time, there was an instrument called the Silicon Mallet that was out and uh, Bill Bruford was doing demos. And when he left the room, we were taking the instrument apart and saw that all, all it was was a piece of plywood with piezos underneath it. And so we thought, well, we could do this, no problem. And that's exactly what we did. So we made a series of electronic marimbas that were made out of plexiglass. The, and the size of the notes were similar to the size that we had been used to playing on the Shona marimbas. So um, they were three inches wide. They were chromatic in terms of the layout, but you could have any transposition that you wanted, and you could configure them in the way that you wanted. And the very first thing that we did was sample the acoustic marimbas that we had been playing on. Emu samplers had just come out, MIDI had just been invented. They were very heady and exciting days back then in the mid-1980s. The other thing that happened was a number of people being situated in the San Francisco Bay Area near Silicon Valley when it was sort of going through this whole explosion of computer graphics was when people saw these instruments and realized that we were completely uh, soundless and playing all electronic sounds, they approached us about doing collaborations with computer graphics as well. And so starting around 1987, 88, we started getting involved with some of the very early computer graphics programmers at places like SGI and uh, New Tech. So I wanted to let you all know that uh, uh, around the same time that Atal was working with the BioMuse, this group that I was in called Takuku was also playing with BioMuse. And we were actually just trying to figure out yesterday. It's read so that this left hand will create a note on the synthesizer. Looks like this. I don't actually have to move, just contract the muscle and well, it plays a note. Now, I can also control the volume. The bigger the contraction, the louder the volume. <laughs> On the right hand side, these electrodes are set to control the pitch. So if I contract there first and then make the note, it's a higher pitch. Ben was just here, he just left about an hour ago, for those of you who don't know him, he was here 
um, working with the Tao on their latest version of Biomuse, which has come a very long way <laughs> since the days we were using it. And in fact, we used to have to fake it a lot because there were times when we would go on stage and things would not work, like the time we did a gig with Timothy Leary. And I don't know if it was just all the drugs in the room or what, but you know, we couldn't tell what was working and what wasn't. <laughs> so um, in the early 90s, uh, we were doing a lot of experimentation in this band with extending beyond the stage to the audience and trying to figure out ways to involve the audience. And this was way before we were even bouncing around terms like interactivity and talking about interaction in an in a audience context. And, um, one of the things that we did was create a device that um, we called the MIDI ball. Let's see if I can. Whoops. It didn't work. Let's try that. And one is bundle of radio sensors inside the balloon. So it's actually a MIDI, MIDI molecule. virtual character that would be like a virtual MC with our group. So when things were breaking down on stage and since we made all our own instruments and we'd have to get out the soldering iron literally and go, you know, distract people's attention, we'd have this character called Rigby come up. And uh, I'll, I'll show you more about that in a little bit. Uh, and this did go through a number of different iterations. Probably in the full screen first. Uh, that won't take me back to the beginning if I do that. No, no, no. Oh. Anyway, so this is just a picture of what the mini ball ultimately turned into. It's clear we put things inside of it. <coughs> we could track it with lights in the audience. We did a number of experiments handing people triggers that were like the, the notes that we had on our marimbas. We also built these drum triggers. Two of the people in our group were Japanese taiko drummers. So we built those instruments that you just saw in the last video specifically to incorporate a lot of this very physical choreography as a part of what we were doing. So there's a little bit more background just about those instruments here. Computer-generated sidekick and invites the entire audience to jam with them during the show. You call them the cuckoo. And hey, this ain't no garage band. Join the techno tribe, cuckoo. Welcome to the world of the cuckoo, where music, culture, and technology speak the same language, and nothing is as it seems. Candace, are you getting this now? Candice Pacheco and Tina Blake, also known as Bean, are the founders of Dukuku. Both women are composers well versed in multicultural music. But it was their techno savvy that allowed them to create their own instruments. We wanted to create instruments so we to play music on that sounded unlike anything else that was out there in the world, which is why we so ended up having the together a lot of the time. MIDI. Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Without MIDI, we don't exist. She's not kidding. Take this Dakuka Rimba here. It looks like a marimba, right? It's just neoprene rubber. You can buy it in sheets. 
It's basically a series of electronic triggers. You hit a pad and it sends a signal, but through the digital wonder of MIDI, that signal can sound so like I thought all your MIDI files were <laughs> What's actually happening here, Gina, is there's an electrical signal that is being converted. It's coming out of the marimba through our MIDI cable, so it travels through this core all the way over to the bank of synthesizers and sound one over on the side of our stage <laughs> where we store the sounds. MIDI is a really for a lot of synthesizers to communicate to each other, sort of like a network on a computer. Same thing with these, the turtle drums. But the technology doesn't stop there. Let's talk about me for a moment. <laughs> Meet Rigby, a three-dimensional puppet with a mind of its own. Ooh, thank you, baby. <laughs> so your part of the show is, is highly entertaining, but... Likewise, I'm sure. There are three things that control Rigby. One is audio. There's a woman, Linda Jacobson, who speaks into a microphone, and the microphone audio level can directly control Rigby's lip movements. Ron Fisher wrote the software program that brings Rigby to life. Hi, everyone. The second thing is Rigby's head motion is controlled by the mouse here. I can move Rigby around like this and make him look left or look right on stage. And the last piece is this device called the space ball here. Just press on it, and I can make Rigby's eyes close. Look. <laughs> Okay, so a lot of that work and doing all this experimentation with live audiences, kind of the next step for me from that point was I was invited to go to Interval Research, which was a think tank in Palo Alto that was founded by Paul Allen. And uh, he has just this amazing place that they'd set up this lab and we became the house band there but nobody who was a research there could ever talk about their work. So we had no idea what they actually did there for, for <laughs> several years, except all these really amazing people were there, artists and engineers. And uh, one, The very first open exhibit that they had, uh, Michael Brook was there in residency, Laurie Anderson was there, Eno was there, all these people were going through the place. And I just, so I just pitched this idea of um, doing, creating a kind of an electronic drum circle to David Liddell, who was the, the then CEO of the company. And he said, sure, why don't you come down and just have a brainstorm session with some of the researchers here. And it turned into the table that you see up in the top left corner, using computer graphics to project onto the table, kind of like uh, uh, electronic call and response. So I've been really inspired by a lot of the interaction and musicality that I experienced being in Africa, being in villages, studying a lot of this music and thinking, how do we create experiences for novices? How do we get people who've never had any training at all to gather together in a public space? What kind of instrument, what kind of device can we give them? How do we orchestrate that so that people can come together and rather than initially I was thinking about being in an immersive space and then started thinking well maybe turning the immersive space inside out and creating something that people gather around might be a way to approach this. So um, there's these cues on the table, the drum pads were embedded in the surface, there was a cover to it that was sort of like a drum head and uh, the active areas would light up as you hit them on the table, and you would hear a representation of the rhythm and then see it, and I, I don't know how much time I have, I'm probably talking too much. I have a lot of videos and stuff that can show some of these interactions, but um, maybe I'll just skip that and say, in these early stages, there were about six or seven prototypes. Every three weeks or so, we come up with another prototype, try them out, throw them out there for people to use. Uh, it ultimately ended up, uh, the current version is what's down here in the corner that looks almost like an arcade game that you would see. And that was after it went to Carnegie Mellon University. So after two years of being at Interval, 
I ended up uh, helping to launch a program at Carnegie Mellon, which was then called the Entertainment Technology Center. And the directors of that program happened to come to Interval literally the day before this device went to the Experience Music Project up in Seattle, and they saw it, and they were like kids in a candy shop, and they wanted one. And when Interval closed two years later, I called them up and I said, you know, I have one of the very early prototypes of this device. Do you want it? And they said, sure. And so right <coughs> after a Seagraph conference, I, I sent it to Pittsburgh and then they had all these bits and pieces and they said, what do we do with this? Why don't you come do a workshop with the students? And that led to me being there for five years. I was, got very involved while I was there in a lot of uh, gaming and, and this was a time when a lot of Japanese games were coming out and arcade games and Dance Dance Revolution was huge and it really impacted uh, kind of the direction that the jam and drum went and working with the students we added, uh, instead of just having the drum pads, added uh, these circular discs around the pads as a way to track the computer graphics that were projected on the table and so we had speed uh, and position by turning the disc and the drum pads as well. And then created this uh, exhibit that was kind of a 3D version of the game that you saw on the table and projected three 10 foot by 12 foot wall projections around it as well. And uh, created another game that was a part of this that was called Hip Hop that was kind of a pattern matching game. And I'll just show you a little bit of that. An invitation to develop an interactive game experience for Xeom, a youth art and technology center in downtown San Francisco, offered the opportunity to create this site-specific installation. The experiences that run in the Jam World exhibit are multiplayer interactive games that encourage team building and cooperation. The experience shown here is Hip Hop, a pattern matching game geared for young people facilitated by a 3D robotic rabbit known as Tokli. Tokli's character facilitates gameplay by explaining the rules of the game in rhyme first and also encouraging players to work together. A series of balconies around the perimeter of the cone provide scenic overlooks for bystanders and a sense of scale for the 10 foot by 12 foot wall projections. was devised to display computer graphics projections on an integrated tabletop surface and playback audio via four built-in directional speakers. Each station has a custom turntable with an embedded electronic drum pad that provides players two input methods to control visual and aural elements of the games. One of the interaction design challenges the team explored was alternating the focus of gameplay from the tabletop surface to the walls. This intentional shift of the player's attention was developed to make extensive use of the exhibit space and also help create a feeling of immersion. In addition to sound effects initiated by hitting the drum pads, each player also controls four different musical tracks. Circle Maze is an immersive gaming experience that was designed specifically for the general installation. Players turn their discs to control a circular ring projected onto the tabletop. From each of the four color-coded stations, with turntables controlling the four corresponding colored rings on the table, the players work together to align pathways that allow virtual balls to travel from the outer ring to the center of the concentric maze. The game starts with one ball. Once players get the first ball into the center, the sound effects, musical backing tracks, and graphics refresh, and two new balls appear. With each advance to the next level of gameplay, the number of balls increases exponentially, and a new set of musical backing tracks and sound effects are introduced. So a lot more games were developed um, working with the students at Carnegie Mellon. 
Uh, a lot of the games moved away from being specifically oriented towards music, just sound was music and sound were a component of the experience, but they weren't the focus of it, with the exception of uh, these two games that one was modeled after DDR and the other one was um, uh, an experience called Jamastrom, kind of a beat matching thing with the, using the discs. Uh, there were a lot of other tabletop installations happening around the same time, Toshio Iwai's work and, um, and subsequent works, but musical trinkets were kind of under development in the late 90s as well. And Media Lab, just to put all this in context, the ATR Lab, usually I don't talk only about my own work, but since um, we're not having a lot of time here, I uh, ended up in a place in Florida called Give Kids the World Resort. This is a place for children with life-threatening illnesses. Uh, I was with my students at a conference in Florida. <laughs> One of my colleagues had a, a daughter who had leukemia, and when she was four years old, she came here, and we were invited to go for a tour. And while we were there, the students were just so, all of us were just completely blown away by what was happening here, and I can talk to you more about it uh, later on. But we ended up doing a project kind of upgrading their theater and creating 4D effects, and the students worked on creating a movie for them. And we also made an installation uh, that evolved from some work that had happened earlier also at the Entertainment Technology Center, a project called Animateering. Uh, this was a project originally done for the Children's Museum in Pittsburgh, they had a puppet display there, a very antique puppets so that were all behind glass. And they wanted to figure out a way where the kids could have a virtual experience of playing with the puppets. So the students made 3D virtual models of their entire puppet collection and then created this idea of having kiosks and with a screen projected in front of them as a way of allowing these characters to interact with each other. We took that. Uh, in a later semester to another step where we cr had kids create their own puppets. So they could swap out the head, the torso, and the legs, like up in the right corner here. And the form factor of the kiosk took on several shapes as well. This was the one that we did specifically for Give Kids the World Resort. The idea is it was in a castle and we created kind of this storybook form factor. And the interface for it uh, got much more involved. We brought in 20 students from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh to help generate a lot of the artwork that we needed for uh, all these different fairy tale characters. So you could have the head of uh, the gingerbread man with the body of the tin man and you know the legs of a dinosaur or something. And, and there would be different animations and sound effects that would correspond with each of these. And it was really beautiful to see all the kids interacting. This was the inside of the theater. Uh, the students created a lot of, um, I was kind of been working in an advisory role with the students. Initially, I was much more in collaboration with them, and it became more and more like I was their teacher and just letting them do more of the work. Uh, but these were leaning audience interaction kinds of experiences, so nobody was encumbered with any kinds of controllers, which was really good because a lot of the kids that were there were disabled in some way. A lot of them were hooked up to IV machines, and uh, you know it was hard for them. A number of them were in wheelchairs. Or, so they were able to do really simple gestures and things and, and see a response happening on the screen. Uh, more recently, I got involved with a company called Thinkwell Design. They're based in Burbank, California, and they do these wild uh, entertainment projects all over the world. If any of you have been to Dubai or heard about this indoor ski park that they have there, a snow park, this was the company that designed and developed that. And um, so they came to us at the ETC and said, well, we have this fountain project that we're doing at the Atlantic City Pier. And we would, we're going to have two shows on the hour. And we'd like to figure out what to do the other 50 minutes. And if you can make this an interactive experience, great. And if you can't, the client doesn't really know anything about it. So if it doesn't work, don't worry about it. But let's try and really think out of the box about what kind of experiences that we can do. So. 
to show you a couple of the videos of those experiences and what happened. We had uh, three different interactions where the fountains would, the lights would follow you. We call this follow me. And there were, it was all about discovery for people who came here. It's a shopping mall and it's got this giant fountain in the middle of it. And it was also three stories high, so people could be looking from above. And sometimes if people were walking by and didn't notice that the fountain was following them, people would yell down from above, hey, go back again. And, um, it was creating this really interesting dynamic socially between the people who were just there and hanging around. So that was uh, the interaction that we came up with for just a few people being around the fountain. This next one called Paint the Fountain, the idea was that you would get colored lights would appear around the fountain. And the more people that you had in your light, the bigger the expanse would be of the color responding in the fountain. So there'd be five lights around the fountain and people would start to compete with each other to see who could bring the most people into the light and then get the fountain to respond. And uh, it was pretty interesting just to see how people reacted to that and got involved in it. And the last one, when there's the most people gathered around the fountain, is called the Gong Show, kind of based off of this game where a light goes scanning around and uh, picks somebody. And if you respond, the fountain will respond to you. And if you don't, you kind of get this blah, blah, blah. person's the navigator and one person is having to pick up these little meteorites that are flying around and they become your fuel. And interestingly, Disney has a ride that's almost exactly like this that they came out with afterwards and some other people came to see this. Um, and then I came here to Stein about a year and a half ago. I was working on a glass project. Uh, kind of investigating the electroacoustic properties of glass. Some of you saw this then. Uh, these, these giant glass discs that were about almost three feet in diameter were suspended.
I worked with some students also to create a game called Peacemaker that was trying to get people to think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in, in a new light. And the idea was if we could get a, a video game in the hands of kids uh, and let them play the role of the other side, what, what would that do to sort of open up and create new dialogue for people? And uh, this, one of the students who, who pitched this idea was in the Israeli army and he just felt really strongly like something has to be done, nothing's working, the situation in Israel and in the Palestinian territories is just unconscionable. What, what can be done? And, and they actually spun out a company called Impact Games and they are trying to distribute this game and trying to work with schools in the Middle East to um, get this out to people. You play the role either of the Israeli Prime Minister or the Palestinian President and you have to balance a number of factors and to basically not only stay in office but also have access to the kinds of resources that you need based on real things that are happening. There's an underlying artificially intelligent engine that is throwing in real-time events that nobody has any control over as well. But, um, anyways, I encourage you to go to Impact Games, check that out. Uh, we also have work on Japanese language learning game with some students. Oh. And, sorry? Oh uh, yeah, that's, um, that must be really hard. It is really hard. <laughs> Not specifically learning Japanese, but to design something that makes it easier, that must be incredible. You know, I have to say that all of the students who worked on this project were really um, Japan files and they really felt very strongly about trying to find new ways to help people learn Japanese and they came up with a lot of really great characters and ways to approach this but I don't think any of them made it really that much easier for people to learn Japanese, unfortunately. But, but it was a really good exercise. Some of my research has really been in the area of collaboration. What are some of the ways that we can think about collaborating with people in new ways? And thinking about what's the focus of the experience? What kind of scale do we have? How do we create interactions for people that don't devolve into total chaotic experiences when you're working with sound so that people understand what their contribution is to the overall mix. I know I got it in this, so um, maybe I'll just end it there. I, I did want to say one other thing, which is I was really inspired by uh, Michelle's talk that he gave at NIME in 2006, and I know this was mentioned earlier too, and he asked these questions, do we operate our electronic systems or do we play them? And I've, I've really been trying to think about this a lot and, and this idea of moving beyond symbolic interaction. He talked about surprise and playfulness, but having fun and the experiences that you have with other people, we're starting to talk about this today, are really important. and I. I don't know if we think about that enough, and I think the connection that you have with other people while you're playing music, that it becomes this catalyst for some other level of connectivity that we're able to achieve, and to help provide those kinds of experiences for people, I think is really a privilege that we're in a position to be able to, to help enable. So I just want to thank Stein for bringing me here, and thank all of you for listening and putting up with all this. If you want more information, you can feel free to email me on tblaine at gmail.com and my website is jamadrome.net. Thanks. I am a Lebanese musician and a composer and actually I moved to France in 98, studied at uh, electroacoustic music at the Conservatory of Reims. And since then, graduated in 2004, I've been working and collaborating with several electroacoustic and research studios in uh, France, such as Césaré, Busmus, and uh, a few years ago, Irkan. And um, in 2005, I actually um, returned to, to my country, in Lebanon, and started also to um, started initiating and developing uh, a uh, whole series of action related to new technologies applied to art, to, uh, the way 
I uh, work on it, and also in the way I saw that uh, these new disciplines were kind of uh, very much uh, at, were attracting artists and students, but that there was a lack of know-how and started to bring this up by introducing new educational programs in universities, uh, by giving workshops to artists, and also by giving lots of attention uh, to teenagers and kids in the, the sense of developing and sustaining uh, the scene and uh, starting to initiate something in that sense. And uh, actually, um, well, my work goes in several direc directions. Um, I uh, use uh, mainly Max and SP in the way I, uh, I work and uh, I play music. And uh, actually, the way I use Max in it uh, in is uh, uh, very much uh, focused and concerned by having an expressive and dynamic way of playing laptop, actually, and being a laptop musician but uh, extremely uh, present on stage and being also able to improvise and to uh, go into to tackle several scenarios and uh, go in several directions. And um, uh, so my way, my way of working uh, on Max is a little bit particular and I can uh, show you, uh, we can listen to a small piece actually that gives an example of what this work is. But to describe it quickly actually, it's working a lot on rhythmic generators and on a series of uh, rhythms and uh, notes triggering that allow me then to be uh, kind of uh, uh, in live uh, managing uh, lots of uh, flows of data that control sample triggering or uh, sound synthesis and um, yeah it's pretty much clearer if you listen to something so Uh, 
very simple basic uh, computer joysticks and to be able to control sound and image uh, with them and so to create small, uh, I would say, video objects, video and music objects, not films or anything of that kind. And my idea was to uh, connect to one computer uh, up to 16 joysticks and then to, con to create a small orchestra of uh, teenagers playing together a composition that they create throughout the workshop that uh, I give to them. And so we end up by uh, creating this piece that they perform uh, for the uh, public and that we record. And so I came to Stein with uh, the idea of uh, customizing the, the first version of this game so I could be able to distribute it to children after the end of the workshop. And uh, actually after my residency uh, here last year, I, I started a project with which I traveled to several countries uh, this summer. Actually, I went uh, from Holland to Egypt to Lebanon to, uh, to France and uh, worked with several groups of uh, teenagers on creating videos. And then my idea was uh, to uh, use uh, new technologies and to use that kind of project to, uh, for social political reasons that were to kind of break boundaries and to get teenagers that normally not have the occasion to meet, to gather up and to discover a little bit more about each other, about their cultures and uh, a little bit uh, go beyond the gap that is uh, increasing more and more between the Occidental world and uh, especially the Middle East at the moment. And uh, yeah, that was it. So uh, the project had took place uh, in September here at The Hague and uh, okay, it had lots of difficulties, visa problems, kids could not come. And, Lots of things, but still, like uh, it, uh, it gave something that uh, really uh, that I still find very important, and I still try to see how to improve and how to reconduct and to work on. And uh, at the same time, uh, okay, maybe we can see a small video of, of this, so it gives you also an idea of what this work is about. Uh, Actually, and also the way I work is that I usually go on the spot and work with different communities. And for example, in Lebanon, I work a lot with uh, Palestinian refugees in Palestinian refugee camps. And I try inside of Lebanon to also, as much as possible, get the